Welcome to Education Futures Reads book discussion. I'm John Moravec. And I'm Kelly Moravec. And I'm Taya Rosman Clark, the co founder and executive director of Green Card Voices. Yeah, and we're delighted to have this chat with you um, in your role of executive director of Green Card Voices, a Minneapolis based nonprofit that aspires to build a bridge between immigrants, non immigrants, and advocates from across the country by sharing firsthand uh, immigration stories of foreign born Americans and really helps us to see the wave of immigrants as individuals with interesting stories of family, hard work, and cultural diversity. So again, welcome. Thank you. So they recently published a book called Green Card Youth Voices, Immigration Stories from a Minneapolis Public High School. Um, thank you for joining us, Taya. Can you please share a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, my pleasure. So um, I was born in Ljubljana. Uh, at the time, the country was still called Yugoslavia. and. Um, I had a you know, pretty great childhood. Um, it was socialism, so um, it was specific you know, in, in that nature, but um, great uh, nonetheless, because when you're a kid, you just don't even know what's going on really. But when I was 15, uh, after a series of um, you know, longer or short wars, the country sort of fell apart, and um, we had a lot of refugees, and I started working in the refugee camps and that really defined my future trajectory in life. So folks joining us on Facebook uh, can join the conversation by posting in the comments box, which might be below or over to the side. And although this conversation was recorded uh, previously, Kelly and I are joining in live this morning uh, via the comments chat. So Taya, what is digital storytelling? So yes, um, I got a PhD in cultural history with a specialty in oral history recording and towards the end of my PhD this new field was emerging called digital humanities. And um, the way I like to define, uh, define it is it's oral history is a field, um, we also call it history from below, is giving voice to folks that are usually not represented um, in the history and um, it really serves to better understand the past events. But digital humanities give us opportunity to use the stories to um, help us better understand also the present and affect and possibly change for the better, the future. So um, digital storytelling is stories recorded and shared um, widely through social media or you know, various platforms or internet. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about Green Card Voices, um, what it is and how it came about. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2013, the several folks, um, including uh, the author of Green Card Stories, Laura Danielson, who is an immigration, story, uh, immigration lawyer, um, Ali Alizada, who's a first-generation immigrant from Iran, a uh, prominent um, uh, businessman here, and I and several others um, were looking for a way to really use stories of really, really wide range of immigrants from different backgrounds, different countries of origin, different occupations, different immigration statuses, different ages, and we really knew that um, once you know someone's story, you cannot hate them. Mm -hmm. And we could already see some of um, the issues, you know, that are very clear to us now, um, you know, four or five years ago. So um, initially we thought we would go s straight to creating books, but I was very, um, just very sure that we, we, should create an entire movement and that the platform should be digital um, and ever increasing and um, that the stories should be um, localized. So going in different communities and just really making it locally relevant. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of piloting, testing, and just brainstorming to, for all of us to come to where we are today. Cool. All right, so just as a reminder, we're discussing uh, Green Card Youth Voices. 
uh, Immigration Stories from a Minneapolis High School. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, this uh, interview was recorded previously, but we are online um, engaging in conversation in the comment box. So please feel free to uh, engage in that conversation with us and, um, and help us move the story forward. I love that you've taken the perspective of digital storytelling or digital narratives. And so <clears throat> while this is very much a printed hard copy book, it's augmented online with videos of, of folks uh, telling their, their personal stories. And I think that adds a real, uh, just you know, a, a beautiful layer of human touch to it. At the end of each video you say, we're all here, we all play a role, we all have a story to tell. I think you talked a little bit about your story, but how does the, your story inspire the work that you do now? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, in 98, um, I was 20 year, 20 year old, uh, working in refugee camps with Bosnian folks in, in Ljubljana, and I, by complete coincidence, got in touch with um, people that worked for Open Society Institute. They gave me a form to fill, and through a process, I was selected as one of four people to win a scholarship to go to the United States to study for a year. And um, I was sent to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, a tiny town in the middle of the Midwest. And um, I got a chance to experience firsthand how it is when your people understand your accent, um, they don't understand your English, um, they have no idea where you're from, um, and the only slight connection to understanding where you're from is what they hear in the media and it was all about war especially at that time so there's just a lot of sympathy um, where while on the other hand you also just want to fit in and be a student and have friends and just be like everybody else um, later on I was accepted to grad school and I studied in at New York University and I lived in New York City and I experienced a complete, completely opposite um, reactions where people really didn't care, well not, not I didn't care, it just they didn't seem like it was that important mm -hmm. where I was from or my accent, mm -hmm. but they just really were interested in me as a person. Um, they were able to see beyond the name they couldn't pronounce ever correctly, um, you know, or my accent or, you know, sometimes strange behavior, obviously, because it's c culturally different. Um, and I was like, wow. So, you know, it's, it, it can be different. Um, we just really need to work on better introducing um, immigrant population to the existing um, so-called receiving communities. And, you know, eventually they will we will all be just able to treat each other as humans and not with all those preconceived notions that sometimes some communities have that are a little bit more um, homogeneous. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so. so what can you tell us about the, um, the process for gathering the stories for these books? So both the digital stories as well as the written stories, um, maybe a little bit about the selection process for the students, um, and you know what what all went into getting the videos up and online and then the written versions in the book Yeah, so um, What what in? piloting the project and really trying to see how we can add to the existing narratives um, I was doing a lot of research and I started to understand that at least one third of EL students are so-called SLIFE students. And SLIFE means uh, students with limited or interrupted formal education. And uh, in Minnesota, for example, um, it's estimated that even uh, up to one third of all the EL students are SLIFE students. So that means coming from war-torn countries and um, you know um, areas where education um, is expensive and folk Sometimes, you know, students didn't have the money to pay, so their education would be irregular. Um, so what, what happened is that, you know, I got this idea, okay, um, I knew from the research that they, when they come here at the age of 13, 14, they're already in the oral mode. So if we just gave them 
you know, a, a laptop with a blank, sc blank screen and say, well, write your story, um, what the EL teachers would tell me is that they would have to wait a very long time for them to be at a certain pretty high English level sure. to be able to do that, mm -hmm. which meant that we really lost um, a lot of the opportunities for students that were here maybe a year, two, three, to be able to express, um, you know, what their experience was. Um, so that's where I found the opportunity and I figured, okay, what if we let them be in the oral mode and recorded the story first, mm -hmm. um, which we did. So I would give every student in advance six open-ended questions. It would be a month before the actual recording. They would think about the questions, they would interview each other, they would practice with the teacher. Sometimes they would even um, write you know, bullet points and other things. They would go home, collect photos, they would talk to their parents. And when we did the recording, it was usually you know, conversational. And what our volunteers then did is they transcribed the entire conversation. So when the students actually started working on their personal essay, it wasn't a blank screen. It was, for example, six or seven pages mm. of their story yeah. um, with, you know, with a lot of content. And then they worked with, uh, again, uh, EL stu student, students who are future EL teachers, who are all our volunteers, or um, other sort of writing uh, experts that help them craft it um, and polish it into a better um, uh, personal essay. I do, um, however, really have to emphasize that we really left a lot of things verbatim as they were stated because we really wanted their voice mm -hmm. to be preserved in the essays. Um, and yeah, that's why you know, we also eventually received the National Book Award and other things because it is the book is capturing voices that no one so far was able to capture and it's because of the digital narrative process that we've included. Right. That's amazing. <coughs> really. So it seems, going back to your, your personal journey and also the journeys that are illustrated throughout the book because it's, it's not so much about intercultural experiences as it's about transcultural experiences. You know, the meshing and blending of cultures or post-cultural experiences. How do I, as an individual, create my, my, own, my own identity kind of thing? So having the stories that, that you've been reading, hearing about, recording, prompted you to make changes in your own personal or professional life? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I practice something that's called radical hospitality. I also practice something that's called intentional diversity. Um, I think, you know, no matter who you are, um, you still are surrounded by people that are very much like you, and you you really have to constantly work on getting to know different people um, that are different culturally or different religion, background, you know, class, professional um, expertise, I think we can learn so much from each other and it's something that needs to be cultivated and be intentional. Mm -hmm. um, and I also actually wanted to add, uh, I forgot to mention before, we use the digital narratives to produce the written um, essays, but then we also edit down those digital um, essays. So every st written story comes with a five minute long personal narrative and every story comes with a link to the online video of each story, we feel written, as, written narratives give you, do give you a certain glimpse, you know? And I personally even prefer digital because there's more that you can see in the person's face or tone of voice or even the pause mm -hmm. um, that gives you even a better understanding uh, of where they're coming from and what their experience was. And as a reminder, for folks uh, joining us on the Facebook live stream, this conversation was actually previously recorded. We couldn't uh, schedule uh, Tayan on, on a weekend. Uh, but Kelly and I are joining in the discussion uh, by following and posting the comments box, and we encourage you to do so as well. We welcome you. So, yeah. 
So has participation in this project helped to shape the lives of, of any of the students involved? Yes, um, that, that was, you know, when you start a project like this, you never can really know how it's gonna go, but um, I'm really proud to say that it has been very empowering for the students. Um, so many of the students, you know, they come from areas where access to books was just, you know, so, so limited. And yeah. for them to be authors of the book was not just a step, but a leap for mm -hmm. so many of them. So they feel extreme sense of pride. And after the book is out, also sense of uh, obligation. And, you know, I was just quoted yesterday one of the papers, you know, that we're trying to create a pipeline for leadership. And, and it's true because once, especially that young age, if you are able to better understand who you are, where you came from, where you are where, and where you're going, um, it's a sense of grounding and understanding. Mm -hmm. And you can be you and, you know, continue on this journey. And, you know, I do believe that some of these individuals are for sure going to be leaders, mm -hmm. and we're also seeing some of them are. Um, so, for example, the first story in the book is Zainab Abdi's story, and in th this past summer, book was out only a couple of months when Malala was in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. She has re she had requested to have lunch with thirteen girls um, from Somalia mainly, and Zainab was invited to be one of those and. Zainab gave Malala the book and told her a lot about herself and Malala was very much impressed um, because she's a big proponent of um, especially young girls speaking up for themselves and education and so forth and um, she was like wow Zainab you shared your story would you mind sharing your story in front of like a larger audience and Zainab was like sure Malala I would Nothing happened for about a couple of months, but then in September, uh, Malala Fund inv invited Zainab to go to the United Nations and share her story. Wow. And yeah, now she's one of two Malala Fund delegates. And in, fa in fact, last week she was in DC um, on behalf of the Malala Fund. So she has emerged um, you know, through this process as um, an incredible leader mm -hmm. um, and spokes girl or spokeswoman for a lot, a lot of uh, people that currently don't have a voice, not just, uh, you know, herself. Mm -hmm. That is outstanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really outstanding. Yeah. So as a, as a teacher, I can see many connections in this book and, you know, ways to, to incorporate the stories of these, these students and their voices, even the digital storytelling, you know, into current classrooms. But how do you envision this book and, and the, your new books being used in schools and classrooms with students? Yes. So um, the reason why I really wanted to create this book was because I really believe in peer learning. Mm -hmm. um, I really do understand that a high school student has a really hard time relating to um, someone that says, well, did you know Einstein was an immigrant or <laughs> you know, was a refugee? Let's learn about Einstein. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's different time and place and, and generation, and it's just really hard to build empathy yeah. through stories like that. Yeah. So, what? So we obviously, you know, again from research knew that it is the high school age when young people are really very actively discovering the world around them, around them, and really trying to understand who the so-called other is. And you know, it's it's that window where we have an opportunity to expose them to all these additional narratives, mm -hmm. or they will just start um, appropriating the thoughts of their parents, right? right? So we have this window of opportunity, and this is why we give schools that purchase a classroom set a 50% discount, because I'm really so um, passionate about getting as many students to read this book, and it's awesome. like. What I love about it, someone can buy this book and put it on a shelf. Mm -hmm. If a school buys this book, teachers can say to students, you're going to read this book because then I'm going to, then we're going to have a discussion and you're going to get a grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so they can just put it on the shelf. They actually have to read it and mm -hmm. they actually have to watch stories. And 
this is that opportunity. It's like, it's not optional. You have to learn about a, your new neighbor. And um, we also created in the back a glossary with a hundred terms and words that, that students might not understand. We also created a study guide uh, that's called Act for Change, where students are encouraged to pick one story out of, out of 30, become, become that student, and then answer questions as if they're that student, because we have learned that that is an extremely effective way uh, to, to create and build and nurture the feelings of empathy. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we envision yeah. that. So I know that Green Card Voices also uh, gathers adult immigrant stories as well. Um, do you see any similarities or differences between the adult stories that you're collecting and those of the youths in, the, in your new books? Yes, yeah, so we currently have 260 stories uh, of people coming from over 100 countries uh, and residing in six states. And out of those, 90 are youth. Mm. So there's a lot more adults. Um, whenever we do the recording, I always ask the six questions um, that are always the same for adults. The last one is always, how do you contribute to your new homeland? Mm. Um, however, when it comes to youth, <laughs> that would be very big burden to bear, right? Mm -hmm. So we always put it in a future tense and uh, we ask, how do you hope to contribute? So we get different answers in that respect. But um, otherwise, you know, uh, you know, obviously they have lived a shorter life, so they can share about profession. But in many ways, the stories are very, very different because um, what the type of digital storytelling that um, we do at the Green Card Voices, it's called life narrative. Mm -hmm. So we start early and continue um, till today and even go a little bit in the future right so um, it's it's many in, in, in many ways similar although I do have to say that um, the youth stories are obviously all young people that came during their youth or childhood even yeah. um, and then you know with adults some might have come when they're 30 or 40 or even 80 mm -hmm. so it really depends um, when, you know, at what point in life you migrate, that really does um, define and, and clearly affects how you experience the whole immigration and adaptation and integration into this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, as a reminder, we are discussing Green Card Youth Voices and we are joined with, uh, by Taya Rosman Clark. And we, this interview was previously recorded, but we are online on Facebook right now in the comments section, and we encourage you to pipe in with questions and thoughts and your own stories um, so that we can keep this conversation alive. Yeah. So, Taya, uh, we noticed that we are living in interesting political times. Um, how does the message and importance of sharing these stories change in light of our current uh, political climate, particularly for youth? Yes, fantastic question. Um, you know, when we first started, like I said, um, we knew this would be beneficial, but it's just so much more important now. Um, because on one hand, you know, um, in high schools, um, I was talking about that great opportunity, you know, um, it's, it's a window when we can re really reach um, young people. But at the same time, it's also a period when young people really don't understand how they can also really hurt others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with words. Um, so, you know, bullying has been on the rise and a lot of immigrants and youth and especially Muslim, um, they're experiencing just so much bullying, you know, anywhere from microaggressions to real hate, hate speech, hate crime. I mean, you, you just name it, name it. And it's just... Even in Minneapolis. <laughs> yes. And, you know, unfortunately, it's like this current political climate and current administration is sort of giving permission to some people who in the past perhaps wouldn't feel like they can express some of these things out loud. Yeah. So
So it's very concerning and we have seen definitely a rise in need um, for teachers to use the books um, now more than ever. And yeah, our book um, sold out, our Minneapolis book sold out in the first five months and we had to reprint right away. And um, we also have exhibits and they have been booked through the next year. Um, right. People really understand that you know, um, there has to be a deeper conversation. Um, empathy and understanding don't just fall from the sky. You need to work to bring different communities together and use different resources. Um, it's a very much intense active process where a lot of people need to be involved. And yeah, it's, it's work, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you were to maybe summarize kind of the big like, overarching message that you would hope someone would take away from having read the book and watched the videos, what would that be? So yeah, I, I'm going to pull up a page here. So it's, it's a world map. And so this book, um, this book includes stories of kids coming from 13 countries. And what's really amazing is that you get to, you know, hear stories from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Ecuador, Haiti, Honduras, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Yemen, and China. Mm. Why this is uh, important is, you know, you can hear a student describing how he had to leave Haiti because of the earthquake. Yeah. Um, you hear someone describing how they had to flee El Salvador because of the um, homophobia. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they oftentimes kill um, homosexuals in El Salvador. Yeah. Um, you hear a story of a student uh, from Ecuador who was left by her mother at the age of five mm. and then got a call at the age of 15. Okay, honey, now you're joining me. Yeah. Pack up. And the child had to say goodbye to what she understood was her mother, yeah. um, uh -huh. was actually her godmother. Uh, you know, you hear stories of, um, you know, students like Zainab Abdi who had to flee Yemen because of war, went to Egypt in a refugee camp, while in refugee camp got TB mm -hmm. um, and had to go through a year-long process to get healthy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, stories from students that have been born and lived in refugee camps in Kenya who are originally from Somalia for up to 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you also hear um, a story of a student in China who is used to going to school six days a week from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. who, and who finds um, school in the United States very, very, very easy. <laughs> 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 so, um, you know, what we like to say is that, uh, you know, sort of in line with the um, danger of a single story, you know, who is an immigrant uh, and a refugee or, you know, who is an EL student? I mean, and this is why when we collected the stories, we really wanted to show that the, really the breadth of diversity of this immigrant experience, immigrant and refugee experience, that we really need to take time and better understand um, who the students are and what what kind of background um, they have and what they've been through um, to be able to to give them what they really need. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've heard teachers say in the past is, you know, just a lot of them are just flabbergasted. Like even mm -hmm. the principal of the Wellstone High School, where the students um, are from, you know, when she finished reading the school, she, she even said, uh, you know, I take pride in really uh, knowing the kids' stories. Yeah. And when I finished reading, I realized I didn't know half of it. <laughs> so she immediately ordered one copy for each of her staff, including the custodian, because she said, mm -hmm. we need to know these kids better. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is what I'm really hoping that... Um, you know, everybody walks away to, to really understand that, yeah, there is, there is William Alonzo who had walked um, or, you know, took different forms of, 
uh, transportation from Guatemala to U.S. for two months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was telling you about. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and there's those that, you know, took a plane and, you know, were in Minneapolis 12 hours later and had a parent already who had a job and a room ready for them. Right. Yeah. You know, so just very, very different experiences. Yeah. So we're educational futures, mm -hmm. so we're looking towards the future. Yeah. So we got to ask, what's the future direction for this initiative and the project? I know you just went to Fargo, so <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting you to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> okay. So yeah, um, you know, early on, uh, we were about two years old, and we were invited to show the Minneapolis exhibit in Vilmar, and I. I didn't know anybody there, so I just, before they announced who I was, I was just walking around the gallery and just sort of um, ears, ears dropping. Do you say it like that? Eavesdropping. Eavesdropping. I always think it's ear. Eavesdropping on what the people were saying. And everybody was saying sort of along the lines, wow, this is great stories, but you know, these are Minneapolis immigrants. Mm. Like Wilmer immigrants, they're not like that. <laughs> So, you know, I, the, the lesson I got is, you know, it's, it's obviously so much more work. <laughs> I wish I could just do one book and have all the communities buy that one book. Yeah. The stories are actually very similar. But people do tend to relate and build empathy with their neighbor, yeah. someone mm -hmm. they know that is actually local. Yeah. Sure. So selling this book in Fargo unfortunately wouldn't work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think Wilmar and Fargo, like people would probably have the same idea. So that's why we said, okay, we gotta go to Fargo too. <laughs> so we created um, another book using the same process, recording stories, and um, these are the students, and in, they come from Fargo South High School, and there's actually, they come from 22 countries. Oh, wow. So hmm. there's even greater diversity in Fargo, and the book launch was just Tuesday, which is two days ago. But I'm going to quickly just also show the, the map. Very different population. They essentially come from many, many um, African countries and from, from the camps in Nepal, and they're Bhutanese refugees. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just very, very different. So, you know, and when you do the recording like that, then you really understand, okay, yeah, you know, that makes sense. They have also a lot of Iraqi and Sudanese and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions that you wish we had asked you? Wow, great question. Um, where you can buy the book? Where, where yeah. We, yeah, dude, where can we buy, <laughs> where can we buy this book? Gee, Taya, where can we buy this book? <laughs> so, yeah, please buy the book online. Um, greencardvoices.com or greencardvoices.org, click on store. Um, and yeah, if you're a teacher and you know can buy a classroom set, we will happily give you a 50% discount, so 30 copies at $300. Um, and with that also comes a free presentation of one of our staff to meet with you or meet with the teachers and explain how to use the book. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I know that there is a teacher's guide available as well. Do you want to just sh share a little bit about that too? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did the teaching guide for middle and high schools before we did the youth book. And um, it, it has 10 lessons. Um, and again, it comes from my observation that teachers were teaching about immigration, but it was a lot of Alice Island. <laughs> and I was like, oh gosh, um, so much has changed. And at the same time, I realized that, you know, teachers did lack uh, materials with contemporary immigration and refugee stories. So the teaching guide was created. It has 10 lessons, is in line with the Common Core. You can also buy it. It is built on stories of 11 Minnesota um, immigrants and refugees from very, very different backgrounds. And yeah, it's a, again going um, back to, to that understanding that we have that, you know, if you make it locally relevant, um, you know, if it's 
one lesson, for example, is um, of is based on a story of Miguel Ramos, who works for Minnesota Twins. People know Minnesota Twins, mm -hmm. so they're gonna be able to relate to that story and that immigrant because they also know Minnesota Twins. Yeah. So that's right. what we're trying to do. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, Taya. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. That's a pleasure. Wonderful. Um, so for our next book uh, club is um, we'll be discussing Lisa Murphy's Lisa Murphy on Play, The Foundation of Children's Learning. You can find details at uh, online at educationfutures.com slash reads. And we will be discussing it online on Saturday, May 6th at 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time. And that's 5 p.m. in uh, Ljubljana, um, in Amsterdam, Paris, Madrid, <laughs> four in London. So those of you overseas can join us, please. Um, so, you know, so let us know how this chat go. Uh, please send us your feedback. Uh, join the conversation. Let us know in the, in the comments box, or you can also email us. I'm John at educationfutures.com. I'm Kelly at educationfutures.com. And you can learn more about Education Futures at educationfutures.com. And you can learn more about Green Card Voices at greencardvoices.com. Correct. How cool is that? Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us.